Thank you all so much for coming out. My name is Amanda Kranz. I am the co-president of Federal Society along with Alex Garrett. Hi. Um, we're really excited to have you all here today. And please feel free to come down anytime and get more food. We don't want to take any leftovers home. Um, if you want to take leftovers home, please feel free to come down. Yeah. <laughs> um, so thank you all so much for coming out. We're so excited to have three awesome panelists here today, moderated by our very own Professor Morley. Um, so our first panelist is Mr. Logan Byrne. Uh, Professor Logan Byrne from Yale. He's an ISP fellow uh, and focuses a large amount of his writing and scholarship um, on battle time decisions made by our founding fathers and their influences on the Constitution. Uh, he also is an author of a New York Times bestselling book, um, and his perspective on Burns is largely historical. Uh, we also have Professor Timothy Ravitch from UCF. I know that's many of y'all's alma mater, and some of you even had him for class, so I want to give him a strong welcome. Um, professor Ravitch is a internationally known professor and scholar on aviation law and is focusing on a drone treatise along with many other publications right now. Um, and then we have Kevin Ross, who is the managing partner in... Don't call me mister. <laughs> <laughs> managing partner and founder of ePlot Law. Uh, he brings decades worth of uh, litigation experience to be focusing his discussion today on the way litigation shapes new laws particularly drone laws um, emerging. So we're going to let them have about 7 to 12 minutes to talk and then open it up for questions. Thank you all so much. Let's go ahead and hand our speakers. Start the history, yes. and then now, and then you know what I'm going to do when the laws get good. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I focus on the history uh, behind all of this, and I focus primarily on uh, the presidency and sort of his or her powers when it comes to drone strikes. And I look back at George Washington, which seems really weird because George Washington, surprise, didn't have drones. Um, but there are many historical sort of parallels we'll see that actually does have an application to today. So I, I come at this from what we call a originalist perspective. And a lot of people sort of have um, their thoughts about originalism. And where I come down is that there's two main reasons why we need to look to this history in uh, interpreting the Constitution today. The first is, I think it's enlightened of us to learn from what the founders did when they're creating the nation. And what can we, what parallels can we uh, look to back then and then possibly contrast that with today? Um, George Washington wrote, the foundation of our empire was laid not in a gloomy age of ignorance and superstition, but an epoch when the rights of mankind were better understood and were clearly defined. In this auspicious period, the United States came into existence as a nation. If the citizens shall not be completely free and happy, the fault will be entirely their own. So I think it's enlightened to us to learn from our history and you know, possibly not repeat it. Um, so this, that, the second reason why we should look to this history is even if you think that's all nonsense, whether we like it or not, this is the exact sort of history that impacts the law today. If only because the majority of the Supreme Court, um, to varying degrees of course, judges and academics use this as at least, at least a starting point for constitutional interpretation. So what does this history have to say about drones? Um, times, yes, were very different back then. Uh, when war broke out uh, against Britain in April of 1775, we didn't know what we were going to do for our new government. We knew a lot about what the king was doing and what we didn't like. Look at the Declaration of Independence. You see all sorts of bad things we thought the king was doing. Uh, but we didn't necessarily have this sort of uh, divine solution as sometimes the history tends to make it seem, where we sort of, you know, we're demigods and we knew what we were going to do next. But we didn't. Uh, our first step was to name someone as commander in chief. So we look around the room. We have guys like Charles Lee, who have a lot more military experience. <coughs> Then we look at George Washington, not too much military experience, had done pretty poorly by a lot of standards. Um, however, he had what they call the, sort of the martial dignity, the principles that they saw as being able to unite the nation. But they saw this job as commander in chief as a very dangerous one. Because just as King George, they felt, had abused it, they're afraid of creating a new American commander in chief who would abuse it again. And this is an amorphous role, so we want someone that we know we can work with to try to find it. So they named George Washington as Commander-in-Chief instead, and they sent him up to Boston. And in Boston, we have about 8,000 red coats besieged within the city, by about 15,000 
very angry militia. These are farmers, these are merchants. We have the numbers on our side. And Washington makes a sort of obvious military tactical decision to shell the city, take them out, break military victory, right? And it makes perfect sense militarily. But it goes back to Congress. And I sort of, I call it sort of the mother may I approach to the commander in chief. It says, Congress, may I shell Boston? And Congress says, no, you may not. Um, and John Adams writes at one point, he's not going to say this, he says, I have virtually no military experience, but politically speaking, it's imperative that you not destroy one of our most important cities. Um, so he says, as you wish. So he defines this uh, idea of civilian control of a commander, even over obvious military tactical matters. Um, as the war goes on, this starts to evolve. Um, we go to the Battle of uh, New York. After, sure enough, after we don't shell Boston, we pay dearly for it because the British escape. And then they invade New York City, and um, we're beaten quite badly. But George Washington starts using uh, what the Americans had in spades, our sort of secret advantage during the beginning of the war was our ability to retreat. We could run very well. <laughs> and Washington used this, he saw this. He's like, okay, what do we have that we can work with? And he said, we can retreat. So it was his notion that if I keep the Continental Army together, that means the British need to keep uh, troops over here, and we're siphoning lots of resources and money from the, the British taxpayers. Very clever. So remember, Washington is not just fighting a regular military war, he's fighting a political one, too. Um, and so part of, all, part of politics was one, draining taxpayers, two, uh, acting in such a way in which he was defining this new commander in chief. So sure enough, he's uh, retreating through New Jersey. And if you look, if you think about a map, um, it's gone, gone from sort of a far off war from the perspective of the congressman in Philadelphia, a far off war in Boston, or still pretty far off in New York City. Now it's coming to their doorsteps. And they know, because the king said it, if they're captured, they will be all be hanged. So this is when they change their tune. Their tune, and they, they name, uh, they grant Washington with what they call dictatorial powers. All right, I know that doesn't sound good, but to their ears, it wasn't as bad. Uh, they would hear dictator and they would think of the Roman Republic. And they look back at the dictators uh, back then, they dissolve the, uh, the Roman Senate, and they give all power, political power, military power, everything to, to one man. And hopefully, he'd give it back after he repelled the threat. And, and the Dominics knew, the founders knew this, it didn't usually work that way. A lot of times throughout history, you give the military men too much power. What does he do? He tends to keep it, right? So they, the Americans, we didn't just copy the past. We learned from it, and we put our own spin. Our innovation on this whole idea of um, this dictator was they, we split out the roles, the political powers versus the military powers. And so what, we, what we, uh, I call this sort of question became a military dictator which doesn't sound a whole lot better, but it is because what it means is the political powers stayed with Congress. The, the, the civilian courts were operating as much as they could. New Jersey wasn't doing too well as a battle zone, but as much as they could, the state legislatures were largely functioning, and the citizens, the people, they kept their rights. Now this is almost unheard of throughout history to have this sort of, um, what was essentially a civil war in which about 20% of the population was actively rooting or fighting even for the other side. But Washington was adamant about those American citizens who didn't even want to be American citizens having rights and it's still his job to protect them. Um, don't get me wrong, if you're in the battlefield running out like, with a gun, he's not going to check your passport, you're going to get shot. But but this it, this has um, interesting ramifications. So quick, one quick story just to solidify what this means. Um, the story of uh, Benedict Arnold. <coughs> Everyone knows Benedict Arnold, the great traitor, right? Most people don't focus on um, his co-conspirator, an American named Joshua Head Smith. So uh, Benedict Arnold decides to go to sell at West Point, which is one of our crucial installations uh, along the Hudson River. Because remember, we have virtually no Navy, um, so we need a land-based defense. And the British want to use their Navy to take home control of the Hudson and isolate those rebellious um, rapscallion New England states. And if they could do that, the war is pretty much over. So we have uh, West Point to defend against that. And uh, Benedict Arnold knows that this is going to fetch him lots of money. 
and Tico he sells it uh, to, to for about twenty five million dollars he would have gotten from from the British for helping to, to do this. And he gives a plan for the whole operation in which he was going to make it look like he put up a defense, but then really not, and then to get Washington to point to point him someplace else and he began. Um, but luckily for us, his co-conspirator, sort of a kind of a sniveling guy named Joshua Head Smith, kind of, a, kind of a social climbing type, but he's American. He, he gets caught, uh, along with um, a man named John Andre, who is a British intelligence officer. They get caught, and luckily Washington uses this information to stop the threat against Russ Point. But then what he does with these two men is very interesting. So he goes to Joshua Head Smith, the American, and says, I have enough evidence to hang you on yonder tree. And he is living. He is angry, he is scared, and everyone thinks he's just stringing this guy up. But he doesn't. Instead, he gives him a week's long trial. He um, gives him, uh, so there's different types of military courts. The military commission, um, if you get in trouble with the military, that's the one you don't want. Historically speaking, the military commission is based on, it's more of a kangaroo court, intentionally so, based on however the commander in chief decides. Uh, modern era has changed a bit, but that's just historically what needs to be. Um, so he's given um, a, uh, a court martial in which there are, is some sort of due process. He has the ability to um, serve as his own attorney, which you're all going to be attorneys. Uh, don't do that. That's bad. Bad idea. Um, but he serves as his own attorney. That's kind of a bad job. But his ar argument, this is Smith, the American, is he says, I was just following orders from Benedict Arnold, who's an American officer. I didn't know I was giving West Point. I just was following orders. You read the guy's own autobiography, and it's kind of like, yeah, right, even in his own words. However, the burden of proof is much higher for an American citizen, and he gets off. Meanwhile, um, John Andre is a much more sympathetic character. He's a you know, British intelligence officer. There's all these stories about he's only there because his uh, fiance broke up with him, he was trying to escape. And, is more into poetry than warfare, and Hamilton likes him, he's a nice guy, everyone feels bad for him. Who cares, Washington has him executed in two days. He's given the military commission, and he is just, you know, or he be shot or hanged. Um, and he wants to be shot and thrown and hanged. He got the, the worst that could have happened. So this is, this is very telling, the way he treats these two um, groups of people. So they, they get British, the foreign national, too bad, very little rights, the chief can do what he wants. Uh, American citizen, it's still very hands-off. It's still according to what Congress says he can do, what the courts say that he can do. Um, and so bringing us back just to drones and team and everything up, and also I look forward to more discussion about related history today, is this is a sort of uh, history that you know we can see time and again in court opinions. You can look at the Heller decision, the famous Second Amendment, uh, left, right, everyone's sort of working some of this history as at least a starting point into uh, their opinions. And so Washington, again, didn't have drones, but it's less about the method of killing than whom you're killing. So sure enough, um, Smith gets away. He actually is taken another charges, um, and he escapes dressed as a woman back to New York City. Um, he's a very unusual looking guy, so it must have been slight, but he, he gets back to um, Manhattan, which is British control by this point. Remember, we lost it. Um, and Washington has means of distance killing. He can't, you know, sit in the bottom, you know, with a screen upon him. But he has, he has snipers. He has the old-fashioned go in there with the spy network and kill him or kidnap him. There are old-fashioned ways of uh, taking people out. Um, but he doesn't use them. And meanwhile, he was using these methods for other people, like trying to kidnap the king's son, for instance. But he doesn't do this against Smith. Again, because Smith was an American citizen. So I look forward to speaking more about how this uh, applies to when you have Americans overseas, Americans over home, uh, at home, as well as uh, versus foreign nationals. Thank you. With your indulgence, I think I'll stand just because I have a few slides to show you. All right, uh, by way of reintroduction, my name is uh, Tim Ravage. I teach at the University of Central uh, Florida. And I do want to thank uh, Amanda Crane. Amanda, thank you very much. I hope I'm pronouncing that. Yeah. Actually, we've just met, so, uh, we've interacted a lot in uh, planning this. Uh, Professor, thanks for being here, and thank you to Barry University and the Federalist Society. 
nice to see a few uh, old uh, students, former students, I guess is the better word. And, it, and also with your indulgence, uh, I do want to put in two of my students uh, this year, undergraduates at the University of Central Florida. Rubens, Mr. Bradford, you can just raise your hands. Um, we have class at 6 o'clock. How, how cool, for want of a better word, is that? That students have made time, they're obviously in law school. You can just make a new friend and say hello and let them know what it's like to be here. Very <laughs> All right, you thought class was embarrassing. All right. Um, anyway, uh, the title of my uh, presentation actually isn't uh, mine, it's yours, right? Attack of the Drones, a discussion of the development of drone law. And perhaps segueing uh, away from um, our last presentation, which certainly focuses on the warfare aspects, the national security aspects of drones, I do want to talk about something uh, different, which is not to be disagreeable, but different. I want to talk about drones for good, right? That this is a socially useful uh, application not just something that is a warfare um, application. It is true, uh, the founding fathers, the uh, founding fathers knew nothing about aviation, except maybe what they what Ben Franklin saw in France. Uh, but drones are nothing new. I know I'm supposed to convince you drones are new and an amazing new innovation. But really, they've existed since second century China, right? Uh, let, uh, hot balloons that would go up for military purposes. So if I my balloon here, you can see how far I was away for military signaling or other types of signaling. So it's old is new again, and, and there we, we can certainly uh, agree. It is true the militarized uh, connotations uh, squelch a lot of the work I do, which is trying to talk about drones, even that word. How do I escape the negative connotations of that word? We see almost daily uh, advertisements or headlines, I should say, like this, about the killing of uh, foreign nationals or even uh, nationals, Americans, overseas or in-house. And even more recently, during Halloween, uh, drones are not such a good application. Here's someone who's put a skull in crossbones or something uh, over a, a drone and blown that uh, around. So we hear a lot about drones as a negative thing. We hear less about drones by their uh, multitude of names, like unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs, unmanned aerial systems, UAS, RPAS, remotely piloted aircraft systems. A lot of names for our purposes will agree on drones, and maybe we can even agree that there are good uses, like commercial drones. I mean, this is a happy thought, right? You all know what this is, right? Jack the Pumpkin King, of course, out here in Orlando. And what's interesting about this is this is uh, sort of happy. Let's pull this is a, good, it is a, a little red dot. Uh, all of these indications suggest that you can uh, use a drone as a sort of marionette, right, to move a puppet around and just be uh, nice looking at this, but maybe, uh, maybe they are, who knows? Right, so this is a good application, certainly, um, uh, sector. As a starting point, we want to be clear that when we're talking about drones, uh, either here or as you go about uh, buying a drone or thinking about drones as a consumer or a citizen, uh, we're not talking about toys, which is this, incredibly enough, this huge uh, model bomber that's almost the size of an adult uh, man. This is a model, right? This is uh, how we could go to the toy store, we could buy this. And we can fly this, uh, hopefully, uh, away from an airport, uh, away from a church, away from a school. There are regulations on that. But largely, this is unregulated. And I think therein lies uh, what the federal society might be interested in, which is the tension between regulation and deregulation. Should the marketplace control how this new innovation, or pretend it's a new innovation, should the marketplace dictate how uh, this new innovation emerges, or should positive government uh, take control? In any case, when we talk about not drones but toys, you should know that this is largely unregulated. There are only guidance documents that say if you fly a drone, do it responsibly, do it safely. Fair enough? And it's led to some very awkward things. It leads to Amazon saying, well, we're not a toy, we're a drone company. We want to be able to fly goods and certain goods uh, to you uh, for compensation. Amazon's on to something. What do you buy from Amazon? I doubt you buy hundred pound bed or a car. Eighty percent of their inventory, in fact, weighs less than five pounds. You buy underwear, you buy books. And so Amazon feels that it can deliver those goods by a drone very effectively. Yet they're not allowed to under current rules. Why not? Busy slide and stay with me. This is what the law looks like. Uh, at the top here is mission type. The next uh, column is hobby or recreation. The next uh, column is not hobby <laughs> or recreation. So let's take a look at how the law has evolved or not to incorporate or allow the technology of drones, right? So here's an example. Uh, taking photographs with a model aircraft for personal use, that is a hobby of recreation. I take up my drone, I take a nice picture of my house, I'm allowed to do that on 
of the car fall. However, a realtor using a model aircraft to photograph property that he is trying to sell and using the photos and property's real estate listing is not allowed. I suspect that should seem absurd to you. I don't understand. You're doing the same thing. You're taking a picture with a drone of a house. But if I just do it for hobby, that's allowed. But if I do it for money, that's not allowed. Why should commerce make the difference? Why should the commercial aspect of drones make the difference? I don't necessarily have an answer for you. Uh, another one I like is compensation. Using a model aircraft to move a box from point to point without any kind of compensation is allowed. So if I wanted to take uh, what is it, a taco copter, ta taco copter or pizza copter, you probably read the news, the first pizza was delivered in India, of all places. Right, but if I wanted to take a drone and just ship it over to you, I could do that. If, however, I demanded compensation, the law disallows that. Why is that the case? Why is the law evolving uh, in that way? It does seem uh, strange. Well, one of the reasons might uh, involve uh, constitutional or even common law conceptions of privacy. Right? The idea is that we're not so uh, worried about commerce, but the FAA, Federal Aviation Administration, is sort of paralyzed. They're really only concerned with making sure things don't bump into each other in the sky. But they're very concerned about your reaction and my reaction, about the ability to use drones to invade your privacy, right? And so this happens in Australia, regrettably, which is uh, a woman was selling her home, uh, they flew a drone over her home, they took a picture of it, and they put it on a big billboard on the equivalent of I-4 in Australia. The bad news for her, she was sunbathing at the particular time. This was her house. She wanted the picture of it, and she was, uh, well, she was sunbathing. So there you go. She was on the highway. Not such a good thing. In many senses, when we talk about drones, we are talking about the Constitution, common law privacy, uh, where privacy is in the Constitution, we, we can debate. But we really are talking, I would say, to you about information, right, and the First Amendment. A general counsel for an agriculture company, for example, is this company. And they had drones and they would go over fields. And what they would argue is that we're not an aviation company. This has nothing to do with aviation. What it has to do is with information, right? The ability to launch something that uh, is supplied by nanotechnology, uh, supplied by that, I mean, the miniaturization of amazing technologies. I can just throw this airplane, and the airplane can do what manual labor used to have to do, right? Go around in the field, be programmed <coughs> out for uh, the health of crops, whether the soil has enough uh, moisture. Really fascinating things that can be used, uh, sort of a, a thumb drive, you put it in to get a lot of data about uh, your, um, uh, your plot. That's a good use, I think, for drones. So let's go back, maybe it is sort of the, to, we go back to history and talk about uh, the various pronunciations of this, I call it the Kilo case. Some of you study the Kilo case? Yes. Right, okay, better know what I'm talking about. Right my understanding of the Kilo case is this involved a thermal imager the police used to cross a street to detect whether someone was growing marijuana, right? And the idea was that uh, I'm in a public space, the police certainly belong there, the law enforcement belong there, and they could detect uh, the various uh, heat signatures of black, I think, I think means very cold, and the lighter colors being very hot. And while it is true, if snow was melting on that side of the house, you would think that there would be heat lamps underneath that melting it. <coughs> this is an even easier, I can see what temperature uh, is in there. Justice Scalia and the majority of the court found that this was, this was an impermissible violation of the Fourth Amendment. Why? Different reasons, I'll let you read the case, but the one I focus on is that Scalia said this is a different type of technology. This is not in the general use. Not everyone has this type of thermal imagery. And for that reason, this just seems to go beyond uh, what 18th uh, century conceptions of privacy would allow. It's true, we no longer adhere to the conception that there is a trespass, there is a breach of privacy only where there's a trespass, right? I can invade your privacy without having to come in your home now. But even this seems too far, even under a reformed tax, remember Katz versus the United States, even this runs afoul of a reasonable expectation of privacy, so says Scalia. Again, this is not in the general use. But what about drones? Are drones in the general use? Such that if I put the same thermal uh, imager on a drone, could I be able to use it now? Do you see it? It's right there. Right? This is a picture I actually took in New York, but this is just on a store down in New York Street where anyone can buy a drone for a very limited amount of money. Democracy is great, isn't it? Anyone can get a drone, but it's not so great because maybe not everyone uh, should have it. The larger issue, as I, as I sum up, and apologies if I'm interfered with, with time here, is uh, the sort of the typical red herring argument that if the United States law continues to react harshly right, and defensively to new innovations, other societies will uh, get, an, get, an, uh, get an advantage, right, to And that might be true. For example, in Dubai, the United Arab Emirates 
the government is sponsoring uh, one of the private initiatives. Uh, here's a, a million uh, AEDs uh, for the best government uh, use, um, and another million for the best civilian use. They believe, the society and the UAE believes, that they can deliver passports and medicine, things of this nature, your driver's license, maybe even your voter application. They're going to vote on Tuesday, right? But imagine that if you're voting. That could be uh, difficult. Anyway, um, <laughs> but imagine if that could be the society. Now, obviously, there are differences in governments, right? Uh, the government there is controlling that initiative and so it moves forward in a way where we have uh, so many more issues to, to worry about. But it is true that the rest of the world is sort of um, getting a hold of this. The final two slides, I believe, are to say that, oh, I'm, I'm exaggerating the point a little bit, that in fact, drones might be one of the rare examples of a positive government and deregulatory impulses actually working uh, together. That the government hasn't overregulated in this context. In fact, it's a head scratcher. People want regulations. They're thirsty and desperate for the government to say what I can and can't do, and the government has been slow. So here, with that sort of posture, they've actually developed some regulations. As recently as August 29, think about that, only exactly two months ago, we finally have a set of laws that say generally where you can fly, and I'm happy to tell you, you can fly for commercial purposes now under limited uh, circumstances. You get a waiver, and all sorts of things that are unique to the uh, practice of aviation law. Some shameless uh, stuff here for further readings. I'll be glad to tell you where to get the stuff I've written or for others. There's a very interesting and developing emerging body of scholarship in the area of law, technology, First Amendment, Fourth Amendment, property. You name the area of law, it's interesting to see how drones are interfacing and impacting uh, those uh, sorts of things. Feel free to visit droninglawyer.com. Hopefully, I haven't been droning well. Thanks for your attention. So now it's my turn. So I'm going to talk, try to touch upon what they kind of brought up in some of the issues and try to tie it into litigation. You know, it's one of the funny things when you're talking about history. Um, decades ago, according to Amanda, when I was a little boy, you know, drones were the scary thing that the military had and you didn't know a whole bunch about it. Whereas, you know, just the other day, a drone to me is the scary thing the five year old neighbor had to crash right into my windshield. You know, that's really how commonplace drones are becoming. And so with that, it's going to become more involved in litigation and the type of litigations we have. I think I'll start with this example of a case in Kentucky. I think it kind of touches on the point where I think the heaviest amount of litigation will be. It's affectionately called the, the drone slayer case. You have two neighbors, uh, two neighbors in, in Kentucky. I won't say where. Some of you might be from Kentucky and I don't want to offend anybody. But you know, the one guy got his new drone, put a camera on it. He's taking nice pictures of his property. He inadvertently crosses over to his neighbor's neighbor excuse me, property, way up in the air. Neighbor didn't like that, so he took out his shotgun and shot it down, thus drone slayer. He also has a website and he sells t-shirts and all kinds of stuff, um, you know, because it really became a famous case in Kentucky, it's ongoing. Um, of course, the police were called, the guy was arrested and all that stuff. The criminal charges were dismissed and they relied on a Kentucky law that's a trespass law of all, of all things, and saying, well, you know what, he had every right to defend his property, he thought you were filming his children, yada, yada, yada and they, they threw out the criminal case. So of course, that ensued in a lot of civil litigation. And mostly the civil litigation was prompted by kind of the regulatory people and stuff, because what you have here, which I think you'll see a lot of, is the conflict between the state law and the FAA. As an aviation lawyer, um, a guy who's done some aviation cases, you find the FAA really doesn't like for states to interfere in their, prop, in their, in their business. They will use the preemption doctrine. We've used it a lot. We defend a lot of aviation companies. It's our favorite thing to do is say preemption. You can't do this state law. So as states start to, to develop their laws on how they're going to try to regulate or at least control some of the drone usage, it's going to be a lot of litigation. And that's the fun stuff that we litigators do. We like to go in there and see how we can affect laws because these litigations generally, how you change the law and you continue to develop the law and make it better. And in this particular case, they use the trespass statute to exonerate them, um, the, 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 the civil case they're actually fighting against and the FAA is joined and saying, hey, you can't regulate airspace. You know, 200 feet above somebody's property is not trespass. It's free. It's as long as the person's operating within a certain range. It's a hobby. It's not a commercial use. So I think that's where you're going to see a lot of the litigation is going to be just on those type of issues. And it doesn't even have to be a drone specific law because this law that the court relied on had nothing to do with, with drones. It started with people having their cows and, and goats and everything go across people's property, and then it's, now you see the use in a drone context. 
I think you're going to have some litigation with what's a hobby versus what's a commercial use. Because one and Tim kind of hit one of those examples of kind of we're not an aviation company, we're sharing information, we're not charging awake. You know, creative business people are going to create creative ways to avoid being overly regulated. You're going to have a lot of litigation, I think, that's going to ensue about with that. Not just privately between individuals, I think with the government, you're going to have it in the criminal context. So I think that's where you're going to see a lot of the opportunity. And also in litigation, um, it's going to be some of your typical things you, you would expect in litigation. I think you're going to see a lot of products liability type cases. No more drones are used in the commercial context, you're going to find that, to give you a good example, my daughter's a film student and I went to watch her film, her zombie movie. She had this really cool, looked like an airplane to me, with this about $30,000 worth of um, video equipment on it. They fly it around, they take the pictures, sometimes they film people in class, uh, stuff you talk about bike invading privacy. But you know, they have these things, most businesses want to try to insure those things. Um, insurance companies don't like to, let's just put it this delicately, they will look for ways not to cover certain things. There's going to be lots of litigation on whether something is covered, especially if you're using it for a hobby versus a commercial use. In fact, we're starting to see some of those cases, not as much, but I think that'll be a very big area where it'll develop, and that'll tie into also the product's liability end. The more drones you create, the more that goes out to the commercial, into the hobby use, the more you produce, the more chances you have for defects and other problems that you have. So I think in the traditional text context of the product's liability claim, I think in five to 10 years, you're gonna see a whole lot more of that in the drone area. Some of the typical ones you're gonna see, like Tim touched upon, is the trespass and invasion of privacy. I think those are more of the ones we're seeing now because there's kind of easier ones, and not everybody has a drone in most of these states, but I think you'll see a lot of that, particularly in Florida, since we have a statute that we're trying to, you know, to, to get to understand. And then the last area I think where you'll feel, see a lot of claims, are kind of two, is in the, in the uh, property damage, like the five-year-old next door that owes me a windshield, and uh, you're gonna see even personal injury when you have these things are flying around, and some of them get pretty heavy, pretty heavy. Imagine something that weighs 40 pounds falling 200 feet onto somebody. You know, well, I tell you, Morgan Morgan has. My best friend over there says that he's got, he's all waiting for some of that to happen. But we're going to see a lot of those type of claims because the more things you have hovering around the air, the more opportunity there's to fall. So, you know, I'm just, you know, keeping mind short, I just think that there's a lot of opportunity for litigators if you're interested in stuff like that, in litigation, that there will be a lot of opportunities in the, the drone area for litigation. Now you guys get to ask us questions. Okay, so I've seen recently, and I'm a big fan, but drone racing, what are your thoughts about that? And is it something I want to invest in? <laughs> I'll let the smart people answer first. <laughs> <laughs> well, it all depends. You know, you, you have the issues you're going to have. I'll tell you from a litigator's point of view. You know, it all depends on how you're going to invest. If it's a commercial use, you can better know your, your regulations and how they're going to regulate it, and you can guarantee yourself that after the first set of actions, when the regulation is going to come even heavier. You know, so that you know if you're looking at, you know, I can't tell you how to invest, but I can tell you from a perspective of looking at things as a lawyer. You know, you always have to be almost two steps ahead of the government because the government always reacts to things. Gosh, we're having all these accidents. Now we got to put these harsh laws. They're kind of like Tim said. You don't want to start being too harsh to innovation, but they will be. We've seen it in many different contexts. So I do think that that that, that um, drone racing, kind of like drag racing or any kind of racing, um, it will be heavily regulated in some way. Have you flown a drone? Who's flown a drone just from the hands? It's it's difficult, right? It's not easy. I mean, I I, I tried and I crashed it a lot. So I mean, what could go wrong? <laughs> it depends on what kind you have. You, if you spend, you know, the thousands of dollars to get the really the great ones, are easier, yes. you don't have to worry about air current or anything. It's amazing how the stabilization, even in the past few years, it's amazing how far it's come. It's, it's fascinating. I was, uh, I, I actually was involved in technology in the airport. I worked for the Man Control Intelligence Surveillance Response Center, and uh, unmanned aircraft was what we were designing for. Uh, um, the Expedition Force Experiment for the rear we had never anticipated it being a commercial technology. We had only seen it in military applications. So to see it in commercialized <coughs> technology, that the military business scores are an entirely different sort of technology. So you see this time and again throughout history that 
military tends to be the way a lot of, I mean, the internet, I mean, for anything, all sorts of things start off with the military because, you know, you have, you know, government spending. There's a you know, big pocketbook to, to build this sort of thing. Um, and, and, and right, for many years, it was seen as obviously a military use. But then we have all these clever entrepreneurs who take some of the technology. Um, I mean, I think at this point, a lot of it's been declassified, especially the older um, bits of it. And I, and I believe that is showing up. But at the same time, it just sort of, um, you take that, that base, and then you have very smart people adding their new twi own twists and things. So it's not, it, I think the military definitely jump-started and, and, and paved the way, but now I think we're seeing it go in different directions. Yeah, because I know uh, when we were, because we were involved with uh, other nations, we came to our unit, we, we did a big exercise um, to send less people into the theater of war by using our manned aircraft. And um, we just never, at any time, did we discuss a commercial use for what we were doing. We assumed it would always be a military use. It just never so even, right? and now seeing so many areas that it's being used in, I, I just, I know a lot of it became declassified, but I'm wondering, um, is that how they got the technology? Or? Does it scare you knowing what you know about drones? Yes. <laughs> okay. Yes, that's my concern. Okay. How much, how much of the military utilization and Technology is the transfer to the commercial side. Right, and I think it's sort of, again, I, I would say, you know, we'll talk about this as well, I'd say that the baseline was there and that sort of that paved the way. I think it's sort of Pandora has opened the box and now it's sort of, um, you know, it, it has its own realm because you do have civilian aviation experts who are imparting their own, you know, knowledge and technology into the drones. Um, so I think it, you know, the civilian component of the drone um, industry is taking over in its own way, especially for these very different uses. You know, instead of delivering packages instead of bombs. Is there a concern that it can be used um, in terrorism? Oh, of course. I mean, even yeah. like, I mean, commercial. Guns. Even standard. I mean, standard. You know, American military again, was has been the forefront, and we have had sort of this you know, almost monopoly on drones for for decades. Um, and now even the standard militaries of other nations are starting to, to build up their own drones. And we don't have how to defend against them. It's creating that issue. And then do these military grade drones get in the hands of terrorists or do they just build their own? And you're seeing in some of these, um, you know, with people with ISIS, they're using drones, and sort of smaller drones, and they put bombs on them and they explode. And it's, it's very dangerous and deadly. So it's just, you know, hard to box them with all the between litigation and commercial use. One of the issues you have to look at too is a lot of the companies that create our military weapons or uh, avionics, also commercial. For example, take Boeing. Boeing is a huge military contractor, but they also build half the planes that we fly. You know, so you get a lot of these companies that they, they apply the same technology on both sides of the coin, except I can't, this part is classified so I can't use it, but the base technology, as Logan suggested, is there. You know, we're building it for both. So we can still build your the commercial one for your purposes. Just, can't shoot somebody from up in the sky and stuff like that. So I think you're going to find more and more of that as the commercial demand for drones are, are, uh, increases. You're going to have some of these bigger military contractors actually get more and more into the drone industry. Uh, a couple of my partners and friends and colleagues have been telling about, we were talking about commercial use. Agriculture is one of the biggest ones because one of the things they have is cutting costs. How much easier it would be to fly a bunch of drones and drop seed or drop fertilizer or whatever it is they drop out, of, out you know, they, they, they do on a regular basis. The drone. You have somebody that sits in a, in, a, in, a, in a room and he just flies it over and it covers hundreds of acres. So, you know, that's one of the areas you're going to see a lot of it used. So, you know, the, to answer your question, I think there is there will, there's always that conflict. Um, some conflict works itself out when you have the military contractors who are, do have an obligation to the government not to use certain of the technology. So, you would hope that that will, that will translate to the commercial side. I have a question about future regulation. Uh, in terms of regulatory agencies, we mentioned the FAA, and in the future, you know, if the government does react negatively to some, you know, accident, if it's intentional or it's not, if someone, you know, flies their drone into a jet engine outside of LaGuardia, if it's the FAA is going to come down and say, no more drones, we're done. Which agencies have the power to do that? Um, 
besides, you know, just Congress general, do we have other regulatory agencies that are capable of you know, restricting significant access to drugs to civilians? Well, really, with the, with the FAA, that's their job. And when you talk about airspace, um, air, uh, the airports and stuff, that is restricted airspace, so you're already violating the law. So, you know, that's why they don't like the states to implement their own rules, because they can conflict. We all know that certain things are, good, are okay in Florida. It's a little bit different when you go up to Georgia or when you go into North Carolina. So the FAA tries to keep control of it. You know, like I said before, as, a, as an aviation lawyer, we love the preemption doctrine as a defense because, if, you know, if I, as long as I follow the FAA rules, I don't need to listen to anything anybody else says. You know, so I think the FAA will always try to keep primary control of that. Thank you, Carmen. So the, um, as you know, say, the Federal Aviation Administration uh, under statute is equivalent to say the United States of America. The United States has um, sovereign control over the airspace. So above 500 feet, uh, it's all national, right? Uh, the airspace over Florida, 500 feet above Florida, 500 above Texas, 500 feet above California, that's all national airspace. There's good reasons for that. You wouldn't want a commercial jet going from Miami, Los Angeles to be a trespass over every city that it went to, so we decided to u make uniform uh, the aviation laws. The interesting thing about drones is I can fly a drone in a subway, which is below the airspace, or I can fly it above this table. So who owns the property up to 500 feet? And does 500 feet even matter? Maybe it's 80 feet or 20 feet. The government would like to own, the federal government, right down to the uh, ground, or maybe in the case of a subway, even uh, subterrestrial. Those are the, and they're not just uh, academic, they're very uh, interesting practical issues about who's going to win uh, that, um, that, that contest. There's a good case, Florida versus Riley, which is a good case to, uh, to look at, about who can be in the airspace and who uh, can't be. But the FAA is going to be the authority. And I will say this, uh, the Republican National Convention, there was a no-fly zone uh, around there. The Super Bowl, the FAA calls it a no-drone no drone zone. So they are coming up with uh, things uh, to this nature. And to answer your question, various states, uh, Louisiana, Texas, I think Oregon has one, have particular laws at the state level that prevent you from going near a critical uh, infrastructure facility or a critical facility, like a, a, a railroad even or a petroleum area. So it'll be interesting to see. But the is the, the Hi, I'm Jessica regarding what happened in Dallas with the shooter. And I just have a question about, like, how is that constitutional that we were able to not be this, not that I condone anything he did, but like, the, the fact that we didn't utilize the police force to capture them, give them, give them his day in court or whatever, if he didn't do what they all do and kill themselves first. You know, like, why was it okay for police to use a drone to blow him up in a, in a parking garage or wherever he was? I mean, it's a very thin line from it just happening in that crazy scenario, which was absolutely horrific. But where's the line? Because I feel like police can just be like, well, we did it that one time, and it was a test run, and it, it worked. And so, you know, like, where's the line? I feel like that's not constitutional to be able to just blow someone up without, <laughs> like, a day in court and a trial and, like, evidence against him. I mean, that was just a crazy scenario, and I was like, why are we doing here. This seems like something that needs to be done not here. <laughs> You're probably right. Uh, you know, the innovation of drones doesn't do away with due process of the law, of course. I will say this, and this is probably as much as I know, which is law enforcement uh, agencies are actually struggling uh, for guidance as to what they uh, can use drones for or not. Uh, you could make the argument that the drone is nothing more than a police camera with a rotor. Right? And to the extent that we're now all citizen journalists, right, we can uh, video uh, the police doing something uh, improper, right? Um, so can a, a drone. And I don't know where the line is. I think you say it right. Uh, it's sort of a, a punt, other than to say you're right to acknowledge uh, that issue. Uh, no one has the answer, and it's unclear if that is going to be FAA, which has no confidence. They, they, no, they have no confidence on the issues of, of privacy. That's more Department of Justice at the federal level. Uh, and states are going to do different things too. I just wanted to flip that. Um, and I think you nailed sort of a broader issue that we're seeing. So, sort of, this gets to the idea of uh, Americans overseas, even. And I think it comes down to, uh, again, looking back to the, the original understanding of the presidential power, for instance, if you are the loyalist on a battlefield with a gun, Washington is not going to give you due process or realize if you're American or Brit. 
Um, so if your charges sort of, you know, if you're flying a plane in the Empire State Building, you could be shot down, I mean, drone or otherwise. Um, and it's sort of, I guess, how, how far back are you from that imminent threat? So then you get to the idea of things like um, Al-Awaki, um, and he was the, the guy in Yemen who was killed by a drone strike, an American citizen, who he was, he was inciting, he was one of the, the, the um, most prominent inciters of people to join uh, radical um, causes. So the American, uh, the Obama administration, finds whereabouts, and he didn't get due process. He was killed. I mean, you can't. The guy was basically the scum of the earth, so you can't do that bad for him. But then you can look at his 16-year-old son who was with him, and you can start feeling bad. You can start it started becoming problematic because, okay, he was inciting people on the internet to do bad things. That's obviously bad. Does that step back from flying to the very State building? Is how far along is this? plan that he has, is it an imminent threat? And you're asking the exact right questions. So similar, you know, but the analogy would be is, you know, the, the, the shooter in Dallas, was he still, was it still happening? Or was he out of ammunition? So it, I mean, put those factors in, um, that's when we start coming with more conclusions, but you're absolutely right, it's, it's unclear. Well, if I could just chime in on that issue, <clears throat> there's another poll of comparison, though. If on the one hand, you could compare him to an ordinary criminal and ask, just as you would with an ordinary criminal, how much of an imminent threat to life is he posing? On the other hand, you could compare him to an enemy soldier. And under the rules of war in wartime, you, the laws of war allow you to kill enemy soldiers if they're sleeping, right? It doesn't matter how how far away they are from posing an imminent threat to life. If they're if they're on the other team, basically, if they're if they're a member of the enemy army, you, they are a legitimate target, you are allowed to kill them, and the, the usual rules about imminency don't apply there. And so one of the, so one of the core disputes about that, that is certainly that arose in the war on terror is, if you accept this notion of unlawful enemy combatant, if you accept this notion that there is another team that's just composed of non-state actors, to what extent do you apply this traditional criminal justice model where you afford them due process rights to the, almost to the same extent that you would ordinary criminals, and you can't use force unless they pose an imminent threat, or how close do you treat them as you would an ordinary enemy soldier, in which case, no matter where they are, no matter what they're doing, they are, uh, you know, unless they're surrendering, they are a legitimate target target for war. And, and I think it's that conflict between the two paradigms that gives rise to most to most of the most troubling controversies in this in this area. The Washingtonian approach to that would be based on citizenship. So if you are still an American citizen, that would be sort of more leaning towards uh, the criminal notion versus a foreign national, when it's sort of you know this is going to sound crude, but it's sort of go to town. I mean, it's the, 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 the president's prerogative to kill any you know person sleeping. There's all sorts of policy reasons maybe you shouldn't be doing certain things. But as far as is it his you know his prerogative to, de to decide, yes. Um, but when so American citizen, you start getting into that sort of more dangerous zone where Washington would sort of be the more mother may I approach and, and follow the lead of the civilian authorities. How will this, and uh, let me figure out how to phrase my question, but how will this look like if down the road law enforcement starts to use this, and if criminals start to use drones, let's say to transport drugs or what have you, how will that look like? Well, not being a criminal lawyer, but I can tell you, it's kind of what I said before, you know, our government's reaction, and it goes to your point, it happened. Everything happens the first time. We don't have a law that can predict everything that happened. As things happen, smart people like these guys here, they have these debates, and I, and I, don't, I don't mean that facetiously, they have these debates to try to figure out what do we do about it. You know, and then we put the reactionary law in. Then guys like me go and take it into court, we screw around with it a little bit more and try to keep shaping it. That's just the way the system works. You know, they're, you know, unfortunately, people who are willing to break law, they're always a couple of steps ahead of you and it's you know, you're just re reacting, you know, when you try to obey by the, our constitution. So I think it's gonna be one of these things that as drones become more and more involved in our lives, they'll start to regulate. They've regulated cars. I don't put them on the same plane, but you know, when my dad was young, you can do whatever the hell you want in a car. They didn't have speed limits or anything. Now there's speed limits. You know, you got school zones. We've reacted to the problems that we have in society. I think that's what's going to happen with the drones. We're going to react 
and keep making laws. There was, I thought, a drug uh, delivery of drugs in a jail. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, apparently that's in progress. Yeah. <laughs> now, uh, what are your opinions on um, having to um, take the drones and uh, get them certified through the FAA or have to um, uh, go and register them with the FAA just in case, you know, something does happen, it can easily be identified to this person and then, you know, something like that. I can try it. I disagree with it strongly, mm -hmm. uh, actually. Um, it, it looked a lot like just very reactive uh, regulations and from a sort of um, perspective of trying to find the bad operators or trying to incentivize the good operators to be really good. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it accomplishes. Okay. Um, it is the law. It is necessary. I think it's around 300,000 people are, are now registered. Wonderful. My drone's registered. I mean, I'm not doing bad things anyway. I'm not acting better now. Mm -hmm. My drone's registered. But it is something that uh, you have to do. The registration here that's being referred to is if you uh, have a, a drone, not a model, but a drone, uh, you have to register just like your uh, vehicle identification number. It's just having a, a unique number. I disagree with that. From a, from a litigator's perspective, I can tell you there's two sides. As a defense lawyer, if I'm obeying FAA regulation, I've got a defense. Right. Leave me alone. From a plaintiff lawyer's perspective, it's great because most people aren't going to do it and I can sue them. Right. So, you know, it's all a matter of perspective. You know, Tim is more on the more regulatory and the, and the transactional side, so he sees it, and I agree with, with your opinion. Um, but from the litigator's point of view, it kind of depends on what side of the coin you're on. Right. It could be good or bad. Cause I, yeah, because I see it, I, I used to be a pilot, and I see it from the perspective of a drone, if the engine cuts out, if the battery cuts out, if the radio uh, communication stops working, and that thing falls in the middle of traffic, that person can just run. You know, you're never going to be able to find them. Right. So the registration requirement for manned aviation mm -hmm. exists really for financial reasons. Right. You know, you want to know where this airplane is, you can get right. registered in the United States, you can get financing for it. Oh, there was a question of right here that the lady would have a computer. Okay. okay, so earlier you were showing your PowerPoint, um, I got to thinking about when you were showing the difference between personal use and commercial use. I think about Google Maps and how Google Maps has street view and how it's pretty much okay for them to just drive down the street and take pictures of everybody's house and post them online. So where can like do you think that drone like you take the legalities from Google Maps and bring that into drone law? How's that believe? You know, I think so. I think it's the same sort of thing. And anyway, someone who would want to have uh, Google Maps as a precedent for having that technology, the drones would make exactly the arguments you made. Like, you can use it in this context. What's different about drones? It's just yeah. aerial and you can do it. People are just spooked, though, uh, about privacy. And I don't know what it is. Maybe something about three dimensions. And, and also the anonymity. I try to buy your house and I do it sort of in a creepy way, you know, every day at the same time, you can call the, the police. With a drone, I don't need to actually be near uh, over your property. I can sort of spy on you. I'm sorry for the you and me kind of example, but, <laughs> but I, I can sort of spy over here. You never know I'm there. And by the way, maybe I register my drone, but I never put the number on the drone. So if I lose it, you'll still never uh, get to me. That's going to be hard to discover. I hope I've answered your question, which is, yeah, there, there's good precedent for saying there's nothing new here. It's just an application in three dimensions. So, So would regulated licensure solve that issue? How so? Well, I mean, if you have to get a license for the drone operation, wouldn't you be able to not only get your information on, but your responsibility with it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, sometimes it's a, it's a badge of honor, right? We, we register, we're doing things, doing things. And when I was general counsel for the drone company, we wanted to wear the white hat. We wanted to say, we agree with this, but we're, we're registering. Uh, if our plane gets lost or there's a highway, you'll be able to find us and pay damages or whatever it is. So I think it can help, I just don't see it how it helps. I don't see it helps the good people. I don't see how it targets that. Does that answer your question? And it also matter of where do you stop? Do I have to register it for my kid? You know? Um, do you have or is it just commercial? So you have you know those are the kind of things you can take too far. Um, with the commercial regulation, um, do you know if there's been any talk about just clutter in the air and what that would look like if they allowed, say, so if Amazon gets the rights to do it, then so is gonna, Walmart's gonna do the same thing and Target, and then you just have just the like, sky gonna go black like when Yeah. You <laughs> <laughs> so you can even see the sky at right. um, There is a conversation about that. Interestingly, the conversation about um, sort of environmental pollution and aviation is actually in outer space. 
um, the satellites died, they just sort of flew around the Earth and they bumped into each other. We're not seeing that uh, here. Uh, and it's a big place. I, I think in places like New York, uh, where there's limited area for Amazon and Target and Walmart to fly, that'd be an issue. In Nebraska, not so much. Um, we're not there. I, I haven't seen any conversation where there's a concern about um, congestion. Kentucky, though, is shooting down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it seems like a lot of the conversation is based around how can we regulate drones the most, what can we do, and how can we get ahead of the curve on making the regulation. But it doesn't seem, I think the FAA is, is not just sitting on their hands. I think they're doing what I would prefer them to do, and that's to kind of let the market determine a lot of it. You're not going to have people just flying drones around and constantly just falling in traffic and they're losing their money. Plus, most drones, if not all drones, when the battery gets low, land themselves so that that doesn't happen. But there are other scenarios I'm sure we can come up with about how they, there could be an issue, but I think with all technology, that law is inherent. It seems that there should be much more of a concerted effort on preserving the right to use drones and, and, and limiting how that right infringes on somebody else's rights, but drawing the line there and being conscious of that line and not just look to say, oh, look, technology is being scary and bad things could possibly happen, so let's throw as many laws at it before that happens when, practically speaking, those things aren't even, they're not relevant because if, if something exists to make drones not worth purchasing, then that will end up curbing the issue. People aren't going to invest in something that they can't enjoy or use. Um, and, I, and I'm just wondering, from your experience in seeing this, is there an anti-regulation lobby? Do you think that's what the FAA is doing? Or do you think it's just a wait till the public cries out and then we can swoop in and put all the regulations in, which is often a tactic that they take to? I mean, I've met with the FAA on this. The FAA, it's easy to pick on them. I think they're actually doing an okay job here, to be perfectly honest with you. I think they're trying to not do what regulators typically do, which is squelch an innovation. If you go back through history on this, x-rays, uh, refrigeration, airplanes, it was outlawed, right? ultra-hazardous activity or disallowed, until we then finally could make a safety case uh, for it. I think the FAA is trying to find some uh, middle ground here. I really do. And I think you're seeing that. Amazon's now going to be able to, to fly um, doing it overseas. I don't think the FAA is completely blameworthy here. I think they're do, doing the best they can. They're just being asked to resolve these property and privacy issues that probably need to be resolved elsewhere. And this may be this is sort of the constitutional framework. Where should this be resolved? Should it be resolved to the FAA? Should it be resolved in courts? Should state lawmakers do it? Should Congress, should the President of the United States, uh, whoever it is, uh, pass a law uh, saying drones are now allowed? Uh, op open issues. I think we agree that law should not spoil the technology, especially here. I'm going to interrupt real quick because we have to do two more questions. I know that uh, two of our panelists have to rush off to the airport. We really appreciate them being there. So, Gary, <laughs> um, what's the industrial um, uh, sector's response to these drones? More particularly, like agriculture. I saw a video of a guy flying a drone for like a, a PETA organization showing very bad or trying to claim bad business practices. Do any of the industries, agriculture, coming out against these drones, uh, trying to pass uh, legislation against them? Well, from what I can tell you about the agriculture, because I had this discussion with some of my friends, they're actually advocates for it, just because it cuts down costs. And one of the reasons a lot of our stuff gets shipped overseas and we buy so much is because everything is expensive and labor costs. If you get rid of those, some of those labor costs and regulations and issues, I can start growing things. All I have to do is have this unmanned thing go out there and I spend $5,000 on it and I get 10 years off. So I think AV, uh, I know as far as the agricultural industry, they're kind of proposed for it. Just one more example on that. Uh, so for the forestry industry, and Back in the day, you could go and they count trees. <laughs> and that's basically how you can harvest and have all sorts of plants. They love drones. I mean, they, they use satellites, use drones, and they're all they're coming up with new innovative ways um, to use drones to very quickly count um, how much land and how many trees are growing on their land so that they can value it. And doing surveys. Yeah. Yeah. It's much easier. Also, throwing there, there's a comment that was, was sort of a how to from the community saying, how can I find a drone? You would have thought it was a railroad convention. They want to inspect their rail lines, out pipeline inspection. 
thought there was a story in North Dakota that were protesters who used a drone to get people's uh, way. Uh, in Japan, uh, they used drones for, uh, for agriculture, but also to show uh, bad whaling uh, or examples of, uh, of that sort of thing. So drones absolutely can serve to discipline whoever you're trying to discipline. At this point, I don't think you can answer that that easily, but probably I would say no. Yeah, I think you're going to have a well, he, he probably has a little bit on The answer is absolutely no. In Florida, it's called the Freedom from Unwarranted Surveillance Act, which has the unfortunate actor of the FUSA. But under the <laughs> Worse. But anyway, that is true. Like under the BUSA or FUSA, I really don't know how to pronounce it, um, any evidence obtained by drone is inadmissible in a court of law under the current uh, Florida law. There are some exceptions. Law enforcement, for example, can use a drone if there's an emergency situation or there's an imminent threat, which kind of makes full circle. I have an opinion on that. How do you, did you know the Boston Marathon bombers were going to happen? No, so if you want the drone uh, ahead of time, political sensibilities will take your, your, your thoughts. But under Florida law, currently it's inadmissible. And that actually is the law uh, in, in a lot of different states who have, similarly titled jokes aside, sort of freedom from unwarranted surveillance acts. The vocabulary tells you a lot about where legislatures think. Republican or Democrat, people seem to rely on uh, protecting our consumption of privacy. If you take it out of the surveillance, for example, um, you know, some of the cases we do, we have accidents and stuff, and you want to take different angles and stuff like that, where it wouldn't violate the statute. Like Tim's referred to, you still have some issues you do with, like you do with any kind of media. And so it all, de it really is one of those, it all depends on the circumstances. Because like any kind of media, it can be doctored, it can be altered, and, you know, 